Welcome back, everyone, to a special two-part series on the Jefferson Prairie Grounds. Per request, Mr. Leonard Arola, I believe that's how you pronounce your name, wanted me to take you guys to uh, somewhere I've been in and with some historical significance. And uh, unfortunately, this place is the only place that's close to me that fits that description. So, Leonard, this is for you, pal. Now, right off the bat here, I'm going to go ahead and say there's a saying that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. Well, I'm going to show you an example of this. See that cell phone? And those of you who've watched the last video I put out knows that cell phone will drop my phone. And here I am using it again, and it's about to drop my phone. Our first stop is at Lake Kruger. Now, this is uh, part of a county park that's been opened up since the grounds closed in 1995. Lake Kruger is just one of two lakes on the property, and uh, several river or creeks flow through the property as well. The other lake is pretty massive. It's Old Timbers Lake, and uh, 17 miles of shoreline on it. It's located at the other end of the property, 17 miles away near Old Timbers Lodge. I'll go ahead and put in a before and present time picture of Old Timbers for you. It's quite a unique stone house. Jefferson Proving Ground was a U.S. ammunition testing ground. It was located near the Ohio River in southeastern Indiana. Its story is one of a patriotic devotion in time of war, both of the part of the military personnel who manned this post and on the scores of families who had to vacate their homes to provide land for this project in 1941 and 42. The stories and pictures depicted in this video are courtesy of a book written by Sue Baker titled The Echoes of Jefferson Proving Grounds. The book was written in 1990, five years before the place closed. Her ancestors moved to the Jefferson Proving Ground area in 1846 on the banks of the Big Creek in Jefferson County. In 1940, the spreading war in Europe prompted the U.S. Department of war to create a new defense project that would force 500 farm families to vacate their homes in southeastern Indiana. The 55,000 acres track of land spread through three counties, Jefferson, Ripley, and James counties. As early as 1938, the war, U.S. War Department, now known as the Department of Defense, was inspecting southeastern Indiana as one of possible several sites for the ammunition testing grounds. They needed an area that was inland, that weather conditions were favorable year-round, without sizable settlements, but adequate rail, highway, and water transportation. The area needed to be sufficient in size for testing of huge military weapons like anti-aircraft guns. Jefferson Proving Ground site not only met these requirements, but was, was accessible to principal industrial, military, and manufacturing centers in the Midwest. The fan-shaped track of land is 17 miles from north to south, three and a half miles wide on the south end, and seven miles wide on the north end. It was 55,000 acres of flat prairie farmlands, rolling wooden pastures, groves of timbers, and fine orchards. Two larger communities, Marble Corner and St. Magdalene, with smaller communities such as Bellevue and Bryansburg being divided by the military fence running parallel to the highway. The transformation from quiet rural neighborhood to the rumble of the first 75 millimeter test round took only 155 days. The sacrifice for the defense of our country was done with such ruthless haste that the lives of hundreds of families were changed forever in less time than it takes to grow a crop of corn. Nine churches, mostly made of stone, existed within the Jefferson Proving Ground tract of land. The stone from the buildings were crushed and used as gravel throughout the grounds for roads. One of the larger ones was located in St. Magdalene. Schools also built by the settlers in the Jefferson Grounds area, but only one 
remained untouched and undestroyed, the Oakdale School built in 1829. I hope you enjoy this two-part series, so sit back, relax, and let's take a ride through time and military history together. Now the entrance road into the proving grounds that we just came off of was two miles from the main highway. Now most of these buildings back here are empty. Some are dilapidated and some are rented out like the place on the right here that we're going past, which is now their county's recycling center. And uh, the Madison Railroad Company also owns private part of this land out here and uses it for storage of, of their rail cars. As you will see throughout the video, they are scattered everywhere. Now the area straight ahead contains ammunition bunkers that they stored the ammunition in while they were waiting testing. Unfortunately today I'm not accessible to this area. It is blocked off and clearly marked no trespassing violations will be prosecuted. So we won't be going back there today. Although there is video of these bunkers in uh, part one or two of the uh, three bikes touring the Jefferson Proving Grounds, if you'd like to go back and check those out in my video list. Now the old gatehouse you see ahead and fence is known as the firing line. Everything north, which we're facing north, is the testing area where the bombs and ammunitions were actually sent and some are not exploded, still laying on the ground and underground.
Now we're coming up to the firing range where weapons were fired from, except for the bombs that were loaded in airplanes and dropped from above. Uh, the concrete bunkers are actually what they would stand behind so that they would be protected while the guns were going off. Picture from back in the day of the first round being blasted in 1941 at the Proving Grounds on these very spots where we are at right now. These concrete pads and protective walls are scattered about every 150 to 200 yards along this line. The military not only tested ammunition out here, but they also manufactured it. And that's what a lot of these buildings here in the heart of the Proving Grounds is for. They were one time manufacturing ammunition, bombs, and different kind of artillery. Today we're starting at the front and going toward the back, uh, the firing range being on the right. All the artillery was moved via uh, railways, which is on the left, as you've seen, and they go from the bunkers all the way down to the airstrip, past the firing range, wherever they needed to take the artillery to be tested at. Taking you now through the center of all the operations right here at the Army end of it where all the personnel uh, actually man the post. Uh, these are all, like I said, manufacturing buildings. There's uh, some for educational, you know, training and whatnot. Uh, all kinds of dilapidated buildings right in here. Some of these buildings have been turned into apartments and uh, duplexes and whatnot for people to live in. Uh, as I said, there is several small 
business is that it uh, rents space out here as well as when all these cars are parked out here because these people are actually at work today. gas station where they fill out the trucks. Fueling station, I guess I should say. Now the area that's fenced off north of the firing line up here is accessible during uh, summer months of the year. It is now the Big Oaks Wildlife Refuge. You have to take a safety course and training um, to get access back there to have permission to go back in there and you have to check in and back out of the gate so that the people know that everyone is out of the pro off of the property by the end of the day. Although you do get a pass to go back there, not all areas are accessible due to depleted uranium, uh, radiation poisoning in some areas is possible. There's a lot of unexploded ammunition laying on the ground and uh, you just it's just not a safe area to be. I do have a couple of videos in my list from back in that area. Um, I stay on the roads, obviously I don't want to die doing this, so, you know, safety first. But uh, I got a beautiful drone flight at the big, dirty old Timbers Lake out there. If you want to go back and check that out, it's an awesome video. More of the firing range.
One thing I love about riding back here is the absolute quiet when the engine gets shut off. No cars rushing by, just birds chirping. That's the Oakdale School. Right through the woods right there is the last and only remaining schoolhouse left in there for the army. Built in 1826, I think, or something like that, 29. And This building was for armor testing. It uh, actually has a uh, plate of armor still hanging in it. I saw in a uh, fellow YouTuber built video, he actually went inside. I see too many keep out, trust, no trespassing signs to do so.
just passed up one of my roads. We'll go back there and check that one out. There's trash running to every part. That part down that way goes to the airport. Check it out. If I was another three pounds heavier, I wouldn't fit in there. This appears to me like two big boilers. And you'll see these pipes running along the ceiling, or along the side, up high outside, going to other buildings. I don't, I'd hate to guess what, I don't know, I guess heating. I'm not going places like this. I leave nothing but footprints because uh, no, I don't. I'm not into vandalizing. No, oh, this is a shitter. Like some people were, honestly. The air was ripped off the wall. Why wouldn't my drift track just eat this place up? This is going to wrap up part one of the series. I hope you enjoyed it. Come along with part two coming out in a few days where we uh, explore a couple more abandoned buildings out here and check out the airstrip. Till then, ride safe and thanks for watching, guys.